Welcome back to the MVPN video series. In this video, we will bring profile zero section to a close by decoding the packets that were captured during the demos. The name of the channel is Decoding Packets After All, right? So let's begin. So first of all, let's discuss the type of packets that we are going to take a look at. In particular, we would be looking at PPIM packets. So all of the PIM packets that are exchanged between the provider routers. Now that's their PIM to essentially signal the multicasting of the GRE tunnel. So those would essentially be exchanged between R1 to R5 and also XR1 as we have seen. So we'll see uh, those packets. We will see the C PIM packets. Now that is the signaling that will be between the VRFs of the PE routers. So specifically in our case, R1, R4 and XR1's VRF C1 which we have covered in the previous videos, and the, uh, the CPIM signaling that is then overlaid on top of the PPIM. We will also see the C multicast packets, um, and we'll see those echoes that we uh, sent from a receiver behind a PE to another, or a source behind a PE to a receiver behind a PE, and how it's actually encapsulated inside the GRE tunnel. And finally, we will see the data MDT, so how does, a, um, how does a PE, once it goes from the default MDT to the data MDT, make that switch over what kind of packet is sent to the other PEs to inform them that the traffic is about to be shifted onto a data MDT? And then finally, uh, we'll decode that packet because Wireshark apparently doesn't do a pretty good job of it. So having said that, let's start with the PPIM packets first. So here's a file with a couple of PPIM packets. Specifically, there is a hello packet, and then there is a join packet. Now, the dead giveaway here should be these are not encapsulated in anything other than Ethernet in 802.1Q. So there's an Ethernet header, then the 802.1Q tag, and finally, there's the IP protocol packet. So it's a regular PIM packet. If you were to capture packets in your enterprise network, this is exactly what you would see. So PPIM is nothing other than just plain old PIM that works, if you think of the provider core as an enterprise network, so that's how it exactly works. Uh, this, these particular packets, so the hello is going to, the hello is going from XR1 out onto the PIM enable interfaces, so these two. And then the join packet should be to the upstream neighbor, and this time the upstream neighbor is four, so the join packet is going to R4 up here. So once that happens, it's also, um, it has a group that is being signaled. Now this is from our data MDT, or actually the source specific multicast video. And if you can see the group here is a source specific multicast group. In fact, this could be the one for the, and if I'm not wrong, this is the one that was captured after the uh, data MDT switch over. So this is XR1 that has a receiver joining an MDT or a data MDT that has been signaled by R4. But other than that, there is not much different about this than if you would capture packets in the enterprise. Next up, something more interesting, and this would be the CPIM packets. So let's go ahead and take a look at the CPIM packets. Now CPIM packets, obviously, if they have to go from VRF to VRF, then they have to be encapsulated within GRE. So in this case, we would see that they are, in fact, so there's the internet, uh, the IP header, then there is the GRE header. And specifically with the IP header, the destination is going to be the either the default MDT group or the data MDT group. In case of the hellos, it's obviously going to be the default MDT group. So in this particular case, in this particular case, this was our, from the uh, SSM video, this was the default MDT group. And that's where the uh, signaling is going to. After that though, 
the protocol independent multicast part, that's absolutely the same. So this is just a PIM packet. Its destination is the well-known PIM multicast group. So there is not much different about this. Similarly for the bootstrap messages. So if you remember in our particular case, we had an RP in the, in the customer core and that RP was on R6. So R6 was the RP and then R6 was using BSR to uh, disseminate the RP information. So that RP information is going to get to R1. In this case, it is recognized by 1.1.1.1. And then what that bootstrap message then is going to do is it's going to get encapsulated inside GRE. So here's the GRE and then the PIM would essentially be inside the, uh, the GRE and it's going to use that to essentially overlay CPIM on top of the P multicast. So in this particular case, in this particular case, even though the destination of PIM doesn't really change, it's 224.0013, the destination of the GRE is 232.123. So up here, the destination of the GRE is 232.123. Let's mark that out real quick. So that's how the bootstrap message then is going to be tunneled over to R4 and also tunneled over to XR1. And finally, they are going to process that bootstrap message. They are going to decapsulate it and send it over to the customer routers. Now, I don't have any captures from inside the customer core because that would again be unencapsulated PIM. Now, finally, let's also take a look at the uh, join prune messages as they come in. And the join prune messages, once again, are going to be encapsulated inside GRE because all PIM messages must be encapsulated inside GRE. So once again, the destination for that is 232.123. So we are still on the default MDT. And uh, the protocol independent multicast, once again, has an upstream neighbor identified on it. So this one is going from XR1. And what XR1 essentially is doing is it's figuring out what is the, um, it's looking inside the VRF to do an RPF check. And from that RPF check, it then knows that for that particular source, so in this case, it is, it is a uh, star comma G join. So if you look here, that essentially means it's a star comma G join and star comma G joins are always headed towards the rendezvous point. The rendezvous point in this case is 6666. And when, our, when XR1 looks into the VRF routing table to find out what is going to be the upstream or the RPF interface towards 6666, it would essentially resolve it to, the, to a BGP next hop of R1. So it needs to send it over to R1. And that's why the upstream neighbor identified in the PIM packet is 1.1.1.1. And it is being multicasted towards that as well. Um, and that's really about it. There's, there's not much else that is going on. By the way, this is also a, uh, it's an SPT switchover. So this is a star comma G comma RPT t which would be down here so what it's trying to say basically to r6 is it wants any other sources other than 10 10 10 10 so if you see that prune is for 10 10 10 10 which is behind r4 so at this point the spt tree looks different than the so the spt tree is going to go this way whereas the rpt the one identified in green is going the other way over to R1. So that's why this particular PIM has a 
join and a prune method. So it's basically an S comma G comma or SAR comma G comma RPT um, packet. So it's essentially pruning itself off. But that's really about it. There's not much else going on except for the fact that this is the, the most important part here is that it is encapsulated in GRE. So as long as you're aware of that, that's going to be it. So that's really it for the CPIM. Now let's take a look at the C multicast packet. And C multicast literally is going to be the groups that have been signaled. So in this case, it was 239.999 that were signaled. They were, they're coming from a source. And what is going to happen here is that this multicast stream came from R10 and it's following the signal uh, signaling that was decided by PIM. It comes over to R4 and then R4 in this case, although we haven't seen the data SPD switch over for that, you can watch the uh, data, I'm sorry, the data MDT video, but R4 is really encapsulating it inside the data MDT. So this was the 232.44 uh, slash 24 group that was the data MDT group for R4. So you can see R4 is encapsulating it in that group. Once again, this is a GRE encapsulated packet, but inside the packet, it's another multicast packet. So it is a multicast in multicast tunneling that we are doing here. And finally, the last part of it is just an ICMP message. And that message is being sent from R10 over to the group 239.999. Further, it's been encapsulated into the provider group 232.440. Now, because this is a data MDT group, so the only uh, routers that should have joined this should have been XR21. So the stream literally should go from R4 to XR, sorry, XR1, and finally over to the receiver behind XR1 that was R9. So that should be how the stream should be restricted. Next, we take a really, really quick look at what the data MDT switchover or the data MDT advertisement looks like. And as I described earlier, it's simply a UDP packet. So as far as I understand, this is Cisco proprietary. But once again, the data MDT packet number one, it's going to be on the default MDT because default MDT is, on, is the only tree right now that has been signaled successfully between all of the... Uh, all of the provider routers. So it makes sense for the data MDT then to use the default MDT tunnel, the GRE tunnel. So once again, it is a GRE tunnel. It's a UDP or it's a, technically it's a multicast UDP in a multicast GRE encapsulation, but it is the default MDT that the data MDT is being advertised on. And, um, there is a well-known, well, it is in the uh, uh, ephemeral range, but it is a well-known port, which is the MDT port 3232. It's user data gram protocol, so it's UDP. And finally, they're using the same destination inside the, uh, inside GRE, they're using the same destination as PIM. So this is all, like I said, mostly Cisco proprietary, so it doesn't really make that much of a difference. Now, Wireshark is unable to really decipher what data is uh, is contained in there. So I've gone ahead and I have decoded that data for you. Let's take a look at this. So in this case, the data This is what the data decides. So I think this first part is something I was not able to decode. So I'm not exactly sure what it is. It has to do something with the data MDT signaling. But after that, you can actually see it's fairly clear. It's fairly clear that 0A0A0A defines the source. So here's your source, 0A0A0A happens to be the source. Then the next uh, 32 bits happen to be 
the group. And finally, uh, or actually what I should say is this is the C group to be exact. And this is the C source to be exact. And then finally, the data MDT group or the P group. So all of that information then is multicasted over to or over on the default MDT. So R4 is sending this information out over to R1 and over to XR1. And the data it has is this data in here. So it's essentially telling XR1 and R1 that if you have any states for this CSCG, so 10, 10, 10, 10, 239, if you have any forwarding states for it, you better then shift over to 232.440. So you should send a join over to 232.440 on the P, on P pimps, on the P multicast side. You should join that because in about three seconds, the data would then be switched over like we saw in the, uh, in the P multicast. So that's where we saw it. And that's how the data then is going to get over to you. It's not going to be sent on the default MDT anymore. Up next, we'll further optimize our SP MPLS core by eliminating the need for IP multicast completely and as well as PPIM running in the core. So we will use MPLS signaling and MPLS itself to handle multicast traffic as we have been using unicast traffic. So we'll begin with a detailed introduction to multipoint LSPs with multipoint label distribution protocol or MLDP. We will then move on to default and data MDT implementation on Cisco devices. But this time the difference would be we would use LSM or what Cisco calls profile one. So LSM for multicast instead of IP multicast in the core. Till then, I would like to thank you for joining us and I urge you to stay tuned for our next video. Thanks.